Hey T heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, we are going to be putting this new baby through the paces. This is our new Chinjo Nishing clay teapot, and we're going to be taste testing this teapot for all types of tea against the Tokoname Shude clay, the Chaozhou red clay, the Jenshui Zertao clay, and a bit unfair potentially, an aged Yixing Zersha Zerni clay. This is our Junda. It's a bit unfair because this is one of my favorite pots, a spectacular pot, but who says I need to be fair? We really want to test this baby out. This is our new Nishin clay. So this is made from Nishin clay, which comes from Guangxi. It's one of the most famous clays in China. There are four traditional famous clays. We've got the Yixing Zersha, of which there are many types, and that's a whole other arena. There's the Jenshui Zertao. Then there's the Sichuan Rongchang clay, which I have not actually tasted that clay myself. Then we've got the Nishing Qingzhou clay, and not part of the traditional four, but still one of the most special clays out there is our Chaozhou clay, Chaozhou red clay from South China. And just to throw a uh, curveball in the mix. We've got the Japanese clay here as well, the Tokoname Shude clay. So let's take a look at this baby before we dive into the comparison. Beautiful shisha shape, classic, classic shape. These are fully handmade pots. So each of them are going to be slightly different. They're listed as 130 mil, but there are going to be natural variations. So please expect that there will be some fluctuations to the actual capacity, give or take, and also the look because they're hand polished. So they're going to be slightly different. You can take a look at this beautiful burnished brown and you can see sort of darker gray black parts. There, is it focused? Focus sun. There you go. And what I love about Nishin clay is just the feel in the hands is something else. Super glassy, very, very hard. This is fired at 1,200 meters. And there's something about this clay that just makes it really, really hard and, and smooth feeling. And you can get such beautiful sort of fitting pots with this one. Oftentimes you'll see these engraved because this clay, more than any other clay, is really suitable for engraving. Because it's so hard, you can get very, very clean, clear engravings on it, which is great. I tend to not pick those because I tend to be very fussy about what I like my teapot to be adorned with and I, I know that designs will get boring very quickly for me. So I want to make sure that it's like the best ever uh, engraving. It's like a tattoo. I just want to make sure it's the absolute perfect one that I'm not going to get bored of. I've not found that. So we stick to the classics. This is of course the shisha shape, which is a classic traditional shape, but there's nothing wrong with the classics. It is beautiful. The way that it looks, the profile, the balance of it, especially for these smaller size pots, 100, 130 mil. I love that shape, that shisha shape. As I said, it's fully handmade. It's got a lovely feel to it in terms of the smoothness of it, but also the weight. It's got a lovely substantial weight. There's something about Nishin clay that has a sort of density to it that feels very luxurious and weighty in the hand despite its small profile. And Nishin clay is made by blending two types of clay from different sides of the Qinjiang River in Guangxi province and supposedly one side's clay needs to be treated differently, needs to be matured, it needs to be stored before it's mixed with the other side and that makes for a very malleable clay which means it can be worked very finely so you can see how tight fitting this is and you can hear how bell-like the sound of this clay is. So it's got this dense feel to it and uh, not just in terms of the smoothness but also in terms of the weight. Nishing is much less talked about in terms of a clay compared to the Chaozhou red clay, the Zertao and the Zersha. And in this video, what I want to do is compare it, just put it head to head with these clays and see what characteristic niching has and what, which teas suit niching clay so that you can decide whether or not you want to add a niching clay to your collection if you don't have one already. Okay. We have done a video already, a very geeky masterclass comparing these four clays where I go through the factors which affect the clay and also 
eventually I come up with my conclusions about which clay types suit which T-types. Now, I'm going to say again from the outset, I seem to always need to put a disclaimer on my videos, but let me just say it. I recognize that every pot is different, every tea is different, every body is different, and opinions change all the time, and it's all dependent on experience, so please don't take this as gospel. This is my opinion. The last video was my opinion, judging by tastings that I've done, and as you'll see, I've tweaked those opinions slightly, and this video, no doubt, is going to be full of very subjective opinions. There are not hard and fast rules, so you're going to have to do your own experiments as always. Also, I'm going to be talking about Zersha clay. This is an aged Zerni clay. There are many different types of Zersha out there, as you know. There's the Junis, there's the Hongnis, there's the Duenis. This is a Zerni clay, um, and there's so many variations in, in terms of performance. So, you know, it, there's there, as always, lots of fluctuations, lots of parameters can shift. So I'm giving you a snapshot of my thoughts on the niching clay. In that video, we talked about the three clay factors which affect the taste and texture of your tea. The first is heat retention, the ability of the clay to come up to temperature and to hold temperature. The second is the mineral shaping. Because these are all unglazed, they're porous, the minerals in the clay are interacting with the tea and that will change the shape, the texture of the tea. It will change the thickness, it will change the softness and astringency of the tea. The third is the mineral flavoring, the ability of the minerals in the clay to either enhance or detract from the tea. So you get mineral mismatch where the minerals don't quite work with the tea type and then you get beautiful complementary minerality that seems to enhance and bring out the character of the tea. So in that geeky video, I went through all of the different tests and different experiments. Go check it out if you want to really dive deep, deep into that. I'm not going to go through all of that again. I'm sure plenty of you are happy to hear. Instead, in this video, I want to make this very practical. I I'm going to be taking the conclusions of our previous video, which basically chose which pot I think is the most suited for different tea types. And I'm going to be doing a head to head of the niching against that clay type for each particular tea. And we're going to be seeing whether or not niching can overtake the winner from our previous experiments. Before we do that, let's check out the heat retention chart. And what this chart shows is what happens if you take the clay teapot, you fill it with boiling water, you leave it for a while so that it absorbs that heat. Then you pour away that boiling water, refill with boiling water, and then put a temperature probe into the pot and then see how the temperature drops off or cools down over the space of three minutes. Now, I know that by putting a temperature probe in, the lid is ajar and therefore you're losing heat quicker than if you would in normal brewing circumstances. So you have to take that into consideration. And this shows averages. So we do that for a few, I think we did it three, no, five, no, three, three times. So we basically take averages. This chart shows you the heat retention of Yixing, of Jian Shui, of Chao Zhou, and of the Shu Dei, the Tokoname Shu Dei. And as you can see, the flattest curve is the Zersha. So uh, the Yixing will have the highest heat retention, the ability to hold the heat for longer, followed by the Zertao. So the Jian Shui Zertao also has very good heat retention, but it does drop off a little bit faster, followed by the Chaozhou and the Tokonami, which has a higher gradient of cooling. And that's going to be more suited or less suited to different types of tea. So let's find out how niching stacks up against that. And you can see that the niching has a similar gradient in terms of its uh, speed of drop off of temperature as the Jian Shui Zertao, but it was much more difficult to get the temperature up, the starting temperature up on this pot for whatever reason. So it's similar to Jian Shui in terms of its gradient, but generally you're going to be brewing at slightly cooler temperatures. Um, and so it's sort of in between your Chao Zhou's and your Jian Shui's. And that's a theme that I think will continue. Uh, just to let you know, I have done some preliminary tests with this niching pot just to get a feel for it. Obviously, we made, uh, we, we taste tested uh, the niching before we 
decided to purchase this pot so we knew the quality of the clay, but I have not done this head to head, so this is gonna be interesting. Right, let's take a look at the final conclusions of our previous video, and you can see a green tick means that I think it's very, very suited, a sort of bronze orange tick means that I think you can use this clay type for that T type, but it's not maybe the absolute best. And a red cross clearly means I would avoid that. I don't think that, that the clay works for that T type. And then you can see that I've marked my favorites out in a sort of pink purple square. What I want to do now is reset this and I want to compare head to head the winners from the previous video with Nishing and we're gonna start with Shangpua and that means we're comparing Nishing with Zersha and as I said, I don't think that this is very fair because this is one of my favorite pots. This is the Junda Yixing Zerni, aged Zerni, so 30 year old Zerni. It is fully handmade and it has the most spectacular performance, especially with Pua uh, If you're watching at the time of release, I believe we've just got 10 that have just come in. So if you're interested in this pot, then go grab it. Highly, highly recommended. So it's sort of like putting, you know, this, this new pot up against the absolute champion. We've already rinsed the tea. I'm not gonna be going through all of the brews with you, in fact, for the rest of this video, I'll have the teas already brewed, otherwise we'll be here forever. But I wanted to show you one brew so you could see how this pours. Um, and just so you know, we've preheated these pots. So every time we do it, we're gonna preheat the pot, then we're gonna put the same amount of leaf if it's the same capacity. But if it's different capacities, then we will obviously use the same ratios. So we're gonna be varying the amount of leaf depending on the capacity of the pot, which I think is the most fair thing to do. Right, let's brew these up. So I'm gonna count 10 seconds in between. Boiling water. And then in here. So these are similar, pretty much the same capacity. So we use the same amount of leaf. We're obviously going to brew quite strong because we really want to get a feel for what is happening here. If you hear noise outside, that is building work going on outside. So apologies, but you know, I can't control everything. And we'll see how it stacks up. I'll be amazed if it comes even close to the performance of this Zerni Junda pot. But I'd be very happy to be surprised. All right, that's probably enough. So lovely pour. And then 10 seconds, and then I'll pour the other one. Pretty relatively fast pour on the niching. Probably slightly faster than the Junda. It's always amazing to me how you think that the clay can't have that much of an effect, but it does. And oftentimes people will say, oh, I, yeah, clay, surely it doesn't really make that much difference. Or it's sort of very, very geeky fine tuning, but pretty much anybody taste testing the difference will notice the difference. Right, let's see. Let's taste the Junda. Mm, thick, luscious, oily soft, just has an ability to, to make the tea taste like it's, it's just been amped up in terms of thickness and viscosity and oiliness. The mineral matching is excellent as well, really bringing out all of the flavors in a balanced way. I'm getting the creaminess of that banana. No, oh, I should say I'm drinking Young Gushu 2020 because, well, you don't need an excuse to drink Young Gushu 2020, anytime I can drink it, I will drink it. It's a, such a delicious tea. So I'm getting that banana pudding creaminess, but I'm also getting the freshness of sort of apple skin and, um, and aloe. Right, let's check out the niching. I'll be amazed if it can match that. Oh, okay. 
same thickness at the start as the yixing, but after you swallow, it definitely becomes a little bit drier, a little bit more quenched, not necessarily a bad thing. Some people may prefer that. Most people would probably prefer that very viscous, lubricating, oily feel all the way down the throat. Here at the beginning, it's very thick, so it definitely has thickened up the tea. It definitely has shaped the tea, but it's less um, attenuating of dryness. And so I'm getting more of a quench, which is gonna to turn to juiciness, of course, which is always the payoff. And the mineral matching is very interesting. It's, 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 it's a, it works but it's definitely highlighting more of the green notes. I'm getting more of those sort of aloes and green bamboos, a little bit more of the flinty nature of the tea. Less creamy than the Yixing Tzu Sha. Oh, pure luxury. Nishing brighter, the minerals definitely stand out. It definitely has character. Do not be fooled by the density and hardness and glassiness of this niching. It definitely adds minerality in quite a big way. And I think that the, the, the pairing works, but it's not a spectacular pairing. It's like you're pairing foods and you know that dish works with another dish. They, 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 you can put them on the table together and people will enjoy them together, but it isn't one of those those immaculate pairings that when you put it in your mouth, the two uh, tastes sort of make something bigger than the whole. But very, very good. So if we look at that chart, I would say it definitely gets a recommended, but not a highly recommended tick. All right, let's move on to Shupua. I have in the pot Fire Phoenix Shupua, and we've got obviously the Gen Shui here, part of our pixel square design, no longer. No longer available. We're working on other designs for Gen Shui, don't you worry. And Gen Shui just always is a winner with cooked pua and hei cha in general. Very fast pour on this one, so I need to time this right. See if there's a color difference. Now, as I said, we've changed the amount of leaf here because it's different capacities. You can see there's different amounts of water here, but we've used the same ratios. So you should be as close as possible. Obviously, it's all gonna vary. They're all gonna, all these parameters are gonna affect each other. Mm, slightly darker on the Gen Shui. Right, here we go. Let's give these a taste. I am gonna be Having a stomach full of mixed tea, it's gonna be a bit crazy. I'm already feeling that young goose shoe. Feel it just from those couple of uh, infusions. Right, here we go. Mmm, Chen Shui, creamy, soft. It has, um, ooh, like an antique book. Oh, it's been a while since I've had this tea. Mmm, creamy. Mm, there's a flavor note there that is disturbing me because I want to get it. It's not leather. I don't know what it is. I have to come back to that. But the texture is very soft. It has a very sweet finish. What is that? Is it vanilla? But it's a very particular... Ah. Anyway, can't get distracted. Right, niching. So that works amazingly and the mineral matching on it works perfectly. Hmm. Again, texture is definitely not as softening as with the Gen Shui, just like the previous one with the, the, the Yixing. But it's definitely there. I'm getting a softening, I'm getting a thickening, and the taste is again, theme is the minerals sort of bring out a lot more of the sort of brighter notes in the tea and sort of add a certain like greenness to the tea. I mean, it's not, you know, I say that and you think green tea, but it's not like that. It's just 
definitely brighter, definitely uh, texturally and flavor wise brighter. Which do I prefer? Well, I'm pretty sure that the Gen Shui is going to win this. Yeah, thicker, smoother, sweeter. It's like it sort of EQs the balance up in that top range. I'm getting more of the sort of uh, celery top and slightly more papery sort of notes in the tea. Again, it works. The mineral matching works. It's not as good as the Gen Shui. So Gen Shui would still be my pick for Shu Pua. But again, I would say that this niching is recommended, just not highly recommended. Right, moving on to black tea. With black tea, we didn't actually find a winner on the previous video. So it's gonna be interesting to see whether or not niching can step up to the mark. We've got our Asamiya Black, which is a new uh, black tea from Japan, a 2019, it's aged for a year, this black tea. I haven't had a chance to do a video about it. But if you liked our Kaori Black from last year, then chances are you're gonna enjoy this one. This one has more bite, has more strength, has a little bit more of a sort of um, spicy, like root beer aroma coming out of it. Here we go. Let's brew it up in the Gen Shui because I think that that was the best that we got last time. Okay. And as I said, we didn't find a clay type that works with uh, black tea. There were a few that were recommended. What did we say? Gen Shui and Chao Zhou were probably your best bets. Oh, Tokoname as well. But none of them were perfect. So let's see. Gen Shui. Nishing. Ooh, noticeable color difference. Pretty remarkable, the color difference in that. Whoa. Okay. By the way, these Gongda Bays are new in. I haven't even given them a name yet, but we really liked. Very, very functional, very practical. Good size, good balance, nice pour. Check them out. I'll put links in the description below. The color evens out a little bit in the cup. Let's taste the Gen Shui. It's soft, it's thick. It's definitely rounded out um, the astringency of a black tea. But there's something about the minerals. Mm, just doesn't seem to bring out the best of the tea. It kind of tastes a bit like uh, clay-like. I mean, it's good. But it's, I don't know if I would prefer porcelain over that, maybe. Okay, let's try the niching. Hmm. Very, very different. Ah, now, definitely, this is a better clay for black tea. At least for this black tea, and in my opinion. Hmm. I'm getting, again, the brightness that it retains that was maybe sort of throwing off the balance a little bit for the first two teas seems to work super well for these small leaf black teas. It's getting bags of the sort of black currant and root beer and sweetness to it. And it's just as thick and the dryness on it is Definitely attenuated. As much as the Gen Shui, no. This definitely has a smoother finish, but it's lost those top notes. Just feels rounded out too much. Niching. Mm. The shaping of it is excellent. Thickening, softening to a point, but you want your black teas to have some bite. And the mineral matching on this is 
perfect. It's spectacular. I really think the mineral matching works. I'm getting the the nuttiness, I'm getting the sweetness, I'm getting those blackcurrant tangy notes, I'm getting the spiciness of the root beer. Mmm, excellent. So finally, we've got a highly recommended tick for black tea. We found a clay type that really works with black tea, at least in this tasting. I think if you're a black tea drinker and you're looking for clay, niching is the way to go. It just does everything right. Shaping and the flavor and probably the, the slightly cooler temperature of the heat retention suits black tea because of its smaller leaf and higher permeability. Definitely, niching is the way to go if you're interested in a clay type for black tea. Let's move on to Yen Cha. Things are getting a little bit messy here. I'm starting to feel this crazy mix. I'm not even halfway through this tea type, so this is gonna get messy in my head, but also surrounded by pots and leaves. Wow. So we've got a very fruity rogue here. So I'm testing it against a rogue sample. Again, color difference, slight color difference there. Darker in the Gen Shui, lighter here. So we picked Gen Shui here. Um, because that was what we selected in the last video. Again, goes to show how Gen Shui is such an all-star pot. It, it, it ticks so many boxes for so many teas. So, but I'm so happy we found a clay for black tea. That's really cool. I normally use Dweni for black tea. So Dweni is a type of Zersha. So again, we can go more complicated into Zersha, but... Uh, Nishing definitely works very well. Okay, so Yen Cha, let's taste the Zertao, the Gen Shui. Very nice, very nice. With with, Gen, with the Yen Cha's, you know, you want that rocky, you know, Yen Yun um, feel and that sort of vaporous aromatic coming through and the Gen Shui certainly seems to accentuate it. It thickens, it softens, but it still allows the mineral bite to happen in at the back of your throat. Let's see what Nishin can do. Good, but not as good as the, as the Gen Shui. Um, so the same theme is here. What I'm noticing is that it doesn't soften and thicken as much as the Gen Shui and the Zersha. We're gonna be comparing it to Chao Zhou next. It doesn't have the same level of thickening and softening, shapening. Um, and the mineral character of the Nishing tends to accentuate the bright, quenching notes of a tea and it throws it a little bit out of balance for me here. It doesn't have the same mineral matching that Gen Shui does and it doesn't leave the mouth and the throat with the same level of luxury that a Gen Shui has. So Gen Shui is still king of the Yen Chas. Let's find out if Nishing can knock Chao Zhou off the block for Dan Song. Oof, I am feeling it. I have to say, I am feeling it. This is a, it's not often that you do such a run of teas. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely affecting me. Uh, we're only halfway through now. Well, we're approaching halfway. This is Dan Song. Dan Song, you know, it's just always about Chao Zhou for Dan Song teas. Um, I have got um, Almond Blossom Dan Song, Xingren Dan Song, which is new in. Oh, mm, it's got like a, a creamy almondy note, but it also has a sort of lemony. Uh, I think in the taste notes I wrote lemon meringue pie, and that definitely is coming through. Dan Songs are, as we know, some of the most fragrant teas out there. I'm brewing in a Mr. Zhang Shui Ping pot. Again, just arrived in. We're getting shipments all the time. So... That has just come back in. We've got about five or six of those. So we, we, you know, we're getting them in dribs and drabs, but they are coming. So keep your eye on the website if you want to pick up 
that pot. Let's have a smell again. Oh yeah. Oh. Buttery butter biscuits. Cooked apples. A little bit of frangipan um, flowers. Very, very different smell. Ooh. Yeah, we could have done that. We could have just AB'd the smells as well. More in the cooked apple note, less of the buttery biscuits. Okay, let's give these a brew. And once again, I would be amazed. Oh, it's just enough water. Uh, I'll be amazed if, uh, if the Nishin can compete with the Chow Zhou. But we shall find out. Oh my God, I've got a bowl full of leaves. Unfortunately, I couldn't separate them all out. This is a, it's a bit disheartening to watch all of these leaves with just one infusion on them. Anyway, that's what we've got to do to get these experiments out. So, Chow Jo, which is also a, an all-star clay in my opinion. I think you can use it, you can see on the chart, you can use it for a variety of different teas. Um, I think Gen Shui probably is a little bit more, you know, of an all-star, but it certainly, Chow Jo you can use for a lot of different teas. But for Dan Song, there is no competition until potentially now. Let's see. Oops, overfilled that. Okay, here we go. Creamy, milky, strawberry. I'm getting those softly whipped meringues, lemon, finish. Dan songs are always going to be more astringent due to the, the nature of the cultivar. So it's dry, but dry to juicy and still held back very nicely. Okay, niching. Let's see what you made of. Okay, so texturally, it's actually thicker. So as we were saying, it seems to have less of a thickening and softening quality than the Zershas and the Chen Shui's, but more than the Chao Zhou. But, and it is a big but, the mineral effect and flavoring of the Nishing certainly doesn't seem to match in anywhere near the same capacity as the Chao Zhou. So the Chao Zhou comes from Guangdong province where this Dansong tea is made. So you're getting potentially a, a, a match simply on the basis of area. They, those two sing. It's still the undisputed king. If you, if you love Dansong teas and you want an all-star pot, but you definitely love Dansong teas and are brewing a lot of Dansong teas, Chao Zhou is is still the way to go. Nishing is okay. I would say it gets a reckon, it gets a possible, you could, you could brew with this tea, but really I would probably stick with porcelain. So Chow Jo is the winner there. Let's move on to green oolongs. We didn't find a winner in the last video for green oolongs. I've got Superior Iron Goddess here, Tie Guan Yin. So I've picked Chao Zhou because I think from my recollection, it is the closest, but hopefully Nishing can take the crown. And I have to say from doing my taste test when I was selecting the teapot, it was green oolong that was the spur for me to purchase this teapot because I felt that there was a remarkable affinity for Nishing clay and green oolongs. I don't know. I have never seen anywhere written that that's the case or that, you know, that, that it should be the case. But from my tasting, green oolong seems to really work with Nishing. So let's hope that that's the case. 
chow jo can work with green oolongs the faster um, arc of heat cooling the cooling of the uh, of the chow jo seems to um, suit green oolongs but I've sort of adjusted my thinking a little bit on this. I do think that green oolongs, because they're made from larger pickings, do require some more heat to it, um, at least at the beginning, um, and for that retention to stay a little bit for that uh, permeability. So um, I think that the niching could be maybe a little bit more suited. Uh, color difference, no, not much. Here we go. So this is Tia Guan Yin, Superior Iron Goddess. It's good. It's good. It's reminiscent of porcelain, a little bit thicker. The mineral shaping on it would be a match, but not a perfect match. It's sort of, I don't know. It, it, it has too much of a too much of a stony addition to the to the tea. It works, but it's not great. Right, here we go. Niching. Thicker, softer. We found the sweet spot that the tea retains those the brightness, but at the same time it softens and thickens. In a Genshui, it would be too much. In a Zersha, it would be too much. In a Chaozhou, it's too little. And this has a more stony, dry quality to it. Definitely thicker, smoother, rounder. And key here, the minerals in this Nixing just work with the green nature, that fresh verdant nature of the green oolongs. I've tested it with a, a high mountain Taiwanese as well. And I just think it, it brings out all of those airy floral mountain air quality. It just lifts them to the surface whilst giving a, a much, uh, much more luxurious, thicker mouthfeel. No question about it. It beats Chow Jo for sure, but more than that, because we had never found a winner, I think that the niching pot, just like with black teas, it is a really good match for green oolongs. And I have, I, we've got to taste it against um, roasted ball rolled but I have a feeling it will work as well. Maybe it'll be a, a sort of a toss up between that and the Gen Shui, but for green oolongs or for lightly roasted ball rolled oolongs, I think Nishing is definitely a winner. So that gets a green tick from me. Now, if you don't mind, I need a toilet break and we'll be back for Chinese green tea. All right, I'm back, and I have to say, when I walk back in this room, wow, the smell in this room, the bouquet, when you have a, a huge bowl of tea leaves that are just sort of unfurling after their first infusion, the smell in here, the combination of smells, it smells like the best tea factory I've ever been to. It's amazing. Right, we're moving on to Chinese green tea. Again, like, we never really found a clay that really worked with Chinese greens. And oftentimes people just say, don't use clay for, for, for green teas. The closest was the Tokoname Shude clay. So this is um, our new Kyusu, beautiful uh, Shude red clay. I've got 83 degree water here. This has been warmed up as well. Um, I'm not gonna rinse. And I'm gonna really test it by using Bilo Chen. So a very delicate Chinese green tea. So if you're going to do it, test it with the, the hardest tea and see if it works. So, you know, we are really pushing, pushing the boundaries here a little bit to see whether or not this is going to work. 
And the key thing here is even though you get uh, different heat retentions and some teapots, you know, will really keep the heat for a long time, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stew the leaf if you start the temperature, you know, at the right temperature, then it's going to hold it at that temperature and it might be okay. Let's see. I should actually switch these around because this is a right-handed Kyusu. So one of the issues with Kyusu is that it is dependent on being right-handed. You can get left-handed Kyusus, but they're not as common. Right, uh, now. And now. Definitely feeling this, wow, feeding this tea, this smorgasbord of different <laughs> tea types. Even for someone like me who's done this a few times, or I'm gonna switch them around again. So I always keep the niching on this side, otherwise I'm gonna get myself confused. But yeah, that's a lot of tea. Um, so there you go, you can see green coil. Bilo Chen, Changsu Bilo Chen a wonderful delicate green tea if it works with this tea then you know it will definitely work with others okay cheers everybody Changsu bilo chen in a tokoname shude fine works nice I just don't feel that the minerals in the shude do anything to enhance the tea. It doesn't have much thickening, so it, 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 it is similar to porcelain, in my opinion. But the key here is that the minerality is just not really doing much for the tea. It's okay. It's, it's an okay match, but I wouldn't say it's a great one. Here we go, niching. So much thicker. Like when I swallowed it, I felt it, you know, I felt this viscosity. Mm. And the minerality really does work with the tea. Taste it again, I don't wanna See if I'm imagining it. Okay, let's go with the tokoname. Yeah, when you taste them back to back, you really notice the difference. This has a very, you know, when I say that the minerals, minerals don't match, what I mean by that is I can taste the mineral in of the clay separate from the actual taste of tea. Whereas when the mineralities match, it seems like it's just an enhancement of the flavor. So it's okay, but I think I'd prefer it in porcelain just for the transparency. This is a really wonderful match. It's, it's thickening and smoothening the tea. It's softening the astringency of the green tea. It sort of adds a slight warmth to it in its thickening, so it does shave off a tiny bit of the top note potentially, but the bright minerals and aromatics of niching just underpin and, and provide a, a platform for the green tea aromatics, those sort of um, sappy, fresh green notes. You've got the elderflower tang and zesty pink grapefruit zestiness um, in the mouth afterwards. All of that is just, you know, brought to the surface and accentuated by the minerals in the niching. I think that is a very, very good combination. It definitely gets a green tick for me. I would like to experiment more with niching and Chinese green teas for sure. I would imagine that it would also work very well for yellow teas. So definitely bear this in mind. If you, if you drink a lot of green teas, especially well, we're gonna test the Japanese green teas, but if you drink a lot of Chinese green teas, you may well want to include a niching pot 
in your collection. Really, really surprised me that one. Let's see how it fares with Japanese greens. Whew. <laughs> this is quite an extreme marathon of teas, I have to say. Woo, okay, I'm starting to see double here. Right, uh, we've got Fukumushi Sayakari Sencha 2020 tea. Obviously, Tokoname is the clay from Japan. It should be the winner for Japanese greens. But with what happened with the Chinese greens, you never can tell. I should have brought a filter. So this is gonna be some cloudy brews, but hey, that's what you get when you get this Fukumushi deep steamed tea. So we're gonna switch it round again for the right-handed Kyusu. All right, let's see how the Nishing handles the pour on a very, very deep steamed tea. So it's very fine particles. It might not be pretty, this one. Let's see, <laughs> right. So, ah, uh, Kyusu, designed for it. Oh, struggling, oh, oh, still handling it, still handling it, oh, now it's slowing down. Yeah, thought so. Yeah, thought so. That's always gonna be the case with teapots like this that are not designed for these types of teas. So just on the basis of form and function, Probably niching is not the way to go. I dare say if I open that uh, pot, I'm gonna see a fair amount of sitting water. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that, but that's not particularly pretty. So, did I move them? Yes, I did. So, um, right. So, already at a disadvantage, but let's focus on taste. Cloudy as you can see on both of them, but more murky on this one. Niching pots never designed for, <laughs> for brewing. It would be fine for, for uh, medium steamed and light steamed sensors that has, still have the needle shape, but with these kinds of sensors, it's gonna block the filter. Right, here we go. Gorgeous, flowery, sakura, oatmeal, smooth nice little um, bit of quench slight uh, bitterness just on the back of the tongue all good creamy brothy flowery mmm oat biscuits and lemon zest great minerality match perfectly it's amazing how you know the area and the tea can have this this match right let's see what Nishin can do okay not too shabby but not as good um, thicker in a way warmer if you want that in terms of the character. Dryness attenuated more, probably. So gen generally the smoothening and shapening is a little bit thicker and a bit softer, but the minerals, they, they're okay. It's pretty good, actually. I, I'm surprised at how good it is. So it's pretty good. I would, I would definitely enjoy drinking it, but I would prefer the Tokonami. Nishing is a possible, but if you're a Japanese green tea lover, then the Tokoname clay is always the way to go. Final tea type, white tea. 2020 silver needle here. So again, new in. I haven't had a chance to do a video about it, but go check it out if you would like to. Great silver needle. It has um, a very um, orange blossom floral note, sort of sweet and flowery, but then a nice sort of creamy, I think in the, in the, uh, oh, in the uh, tasting notes, I wrote semolina. And we have a slight problem here in that I can see still a tiny few traces of fukumushi going on. So I'm gonna quickly pour this. 
<laughs> this is getting chaotic. But what did you expect? Uh, how many tea types have I had? Sheng, Shu, uh, Black, Yensha, Dansong, uh, Green Oolong, Chinese Green, you know, I've, this is my ninth tea type. So it was always gonna be a bit of a chaos one, this video. Right, Jen Shui. Lovely, thick, soft, velvety. Just works so well with the character of white tea. Perhaps if you had a bit more of a green, like a Zheng He style white peony bai mu dan, then maybe it's gonna be more suited to a little bit more of a, the, the higher notes that I predict this niching is gonna provide. But even then, this Zhen Shui just sings with white tea. Hmm. Okay. Mineral matches very well, actually. Sort of brings out a little bit more of the spice in it and a little bit, yeah, like, um, I'm getting more um, white pepper, jasmine, a little bit of zestiness. Very, very nice, difficult one, this one. Mmm surprising but the finish is I, I, I kind of like with white teas that very luxurious finish that very soft silky finish and the Gen Shui just gives me that and the flavor profile is very balanced this is definitely having a marked effect on the flavor it's definitely bringing out more of that spice. I really like it. I still think Gen Shui is probably my winner here, although it is close, but I would say I would recommend Gen Shui over niching. However, you can certainly brew niching for white teas. And as I said, maybe for white peonies, for more of those sort of spicy, lighter, greener, white teas, then maybe niching may take over. But as it stands, I'm gonna go with a recommended, but not super highly recommended compared with the Gen Shui. Okay, I need to regroup, get my head together, remember what I've said about all of the other tea types, and then we're gonna come back with our final conclusions. Right, I've had a chance to sober up. That took a, an hour and I need to review everything that I've just said, so. Here are my final conclusions regarding this niching. And again, I'm gonna say, this is all opinion, this is all snapshots. Feel free to make your own opinions and test things out yourself. But from the tastings that I've done previously and the tastings that I've done today, I think that the character of this clay is somewhere in between Gen Shui and Chao Zhou. If you look at the previous chart that we did about the clay types and character, you can see that we talked about the thickening, the softening, the bitterness attenuation, the mineral adding, and the retention of brightness. This is what we did in the last video. And you can see that Zersha, Yixing Zersha is very good at thickening, at softening, at reducing bitterness. It adds minerality, it adds a lot of flavor and minerality, although it can be mismatching flavor, but it attenuates brightness quite considerably. Compared to Gen Shui, which is that yellow color, it means it has some strong thickening, softening, and reduction of bitterness, but not quite as much as the Yixing Zersha, and it doesn't add much minerality, it's more transparent, and it does attenuate brightness a fair amount. And then you have Chao Zhou being less thickness, less softening, less a reduction of bitterness, some, but not, not a huge amount. And then the adding of minerals is very strong and retention of brightness is very strong. And Tokaname is similar, but has even less thickening potential. And the minerals are, it's a little bit more transparent. And I think that niching fits in between Chao Zhou and Gen Shui in the sense that I think it has more thickening and more softening than Chao Zhou, but slightly less than Gen Shui. I think it has 
a similar amount of reduction of bitterness as the Chaozhou, Zhou, and it is strong in adding minerality, probably not quite as much as the Zersha and the Chaozhou, Zhou, but you definitely have a character which is surprising given the sort of dense, glassy feel of it. You would imagine that it's a little bit more neutral, but I really think it has a very strong character in terms of its minerality. And finally, it retains brightness in a really, really good way. So I think that the Nishing has medium softening and rounding and medium to strong minerality and preserves brightness very well. And that's why I'd throw it in between Zhen Shui and Chaozhou. If you look at the chart of tea types, I think that Nishing can be used for all tea types, but I would specifically recommend it for black teas, green oolongs, and Chinese green teas. You can see the other winners there marked in that sort of purple pink rectangle. I don't want to come across that I am giving you like the gospel on clay types because it is a matter of personal opinion. But for me, I would say that Zersha, Yixing Zersha is great if you are a poor drinker, you want to drink raw poor, you want to drink cooked poor. Ideally, probably you'd separate them out. So you'd have one for cooked and one for raw, but that's up to you, of course. But I definitely think that Zersha is still the winner for poor tea. I think that the Tokaname is definitely the winner for uh, Japanese green teas. Definitely. I wouldn't drink Japanese green teas in anything other than porcelain glass or Tokaname uh, Shude clay. But these three in the middle, these three are my all-star pots. You can brew them for many different types of tea. I would say that if you are a Dantong lover, then Chaozhou is probably your all-star because if you are going to be brewing a lot of Dantong, it's definitely the king of Dantong teas and it can brew other teas very well. I would say if you are interested in white teas, in cooked pu'er teas in roasted yen chas and strip oolongs, if that is more your territory, so slightly more in the, in the warmer, deeper notes, then Chen Shui Zetao is your all-star pot of choice. And I would say that if you are looking for an all-star pot and you drink a fair amount of Chinese greens, you drink a fair amount of green oolongs and you like your black teas, then Nishing is probably the one to get. Those are my final conclusions. Feel free to give me your conclusions in the comments section below. I hope that this video has given you some pointers in the right direction when you are making your clay selection. That's it, tea heads. Check out our other videos, Taste Our Teas, wherever you are in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye. Man, check this out. <laughs> that is a lot of tea that I drank through in an hour.